Welcome to In the Ven Zone with Christine McKay, where we get candid about what it takes to negotiate effectively. You'll learn from the challenges and successes of entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. We help you change the nature of your negotiations and get more from every deal you do. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another amazing episode of In the Ven Zone, where we help you, the small and mid-sized company, elevate your negotiation. And we do that by bringing you fantastic guests. And today is no exception. I always just love having, I love my guests. Um, we have today Jamil Rodriguez. And Jamil is a, what a great, great story. He is the owner of Laced, uh, Laced in Boston. And and they have six stores in this amazing collective of stores. They are consignment stores selling boutique uh, sneakers and uh, high-end sneakers. And they have expanded dramatically through COVID. Um, they have six stores now. Um, Jamil recently opened a new restaurant. Um, and just he's just like going gangbusters. And he is making waves in the Boston market. And we are really excited to have him here to talk about kind of his growth, but also really curious about the negotiation that happens around consignment because that's that is it that is a real negotiation and in an earlier meeting with Jamil he had some great stories and if you're really excited about this episode make sure you go to ven.zone v-e-n-n.zone to check out the show notes and to get all the links and all the information about everything in the show and we have a free gift waiting for you there so Jamil thank you for being here welcome glad to have you Thank you. Thanks for such a great intro. Well, my pleasure. So it's an honor to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you come to be, you know, a, a, a sneaker mogul? I'll call you a mogul. <laughs> well, let's, let's see. Uh, how long is this show? Because it could, I could give you the long version or the short version. Um, I think the, the quick and short answer to it is... Um, by mistake. Um, I've always loved sneakers and I've had a passion for them. And my older brothers uh, collected sneakers and it was just part of our lifestyle. Um, never thought it could be or turn into a business. Um, but sneaker collecting has become the new baseball cards, uh, the new comic books. And the only difference is you can wear them out and, you know, they become a status symbol and um, almost like a means to show you know, you can show off a little bit and maybe measure some success to some degree, um, you know, some would say, and a confidence boosted to say the least. Mm -hmm. So my passion and my love for sneakers um, is kind of what brought me here. Awesome. And so how did you tell us about the, at what point did you decide to go into, to, to own your own store? How did you, how did you come to that first store? I was doing real estate at the time. Um, and I had actually opened an escape and snowboard shop. That was my first initial business. And, and yeah. I really came from my passion of snowboarding. And I wanted to be a snow bum. I don't know if that's equivalent to a beach bum, but um, I think you get the point. I wanted to open a ski shop, snowboard shop near, near a ski slope, near somewhere where I could, you know, get to snowboard as often as I could. Um, after having took a long break from doing it for many years, I went back and I went back strong and I was like, man, I don't know why I stopped. Um, but I was doing real estate and I was doing pretty good at it. I made a few good commissions. I jokingly answered my cell phone one day and said, uh, boardroom, Boston snowboard shop. And my friend was like, that's such a cool name. And I was like, well, why don't we open one? And I just, uh, and, uh, you know, of course, he agreed with me and <laughs> and I started looking for space and uh, surprisingly so the, the space. Um, it's crazy how life is the first space I, I thought I wanted and I loved. Um, I got denied for because um, the management company had kicked me out of an apartment that they owned before. And I was back at the drawing board and then I found an even better space. And it turns out my real estate office had the listing. So that was like a, you know, it was so easy. The second one, I just was like a meant to be. It was in downtown. It was in the financial district. The name was Boardroom Boston. I did this logo that looked like 
almost like a business, uh, you know, very non-skate at all. Like kind of like, so you didn't know what it was. It's in a financial district. It was called boardroom. It could have been this fancy boardroom meeting place. It was just 300 square feet of snowboards and skateboards. So real true play on words. Um, and uh, as I was building that out, my friends um, had partnered uh, with the original owner of Laced and they'd been in it for about two years. And I think um, they were having some friction and were ready to dissolve it and offered me the, the space and offered me the store. And I said no twice. I said, I'm already doing something. I want to keep a little nest egg. I don't know how it's going to go. Um, and I said no twice. I remember getting the third phone call as I was driving by it. And it was originally on Columbus Ave at the corner of Mass Ave, 569 Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, and I was driving by and he called me and I said, you know what, I'm going to pull over and take a look. And I took a look. I went in there and I'm like, man, this is an 1800 square foot store with, you know, an office and surveillance cameras and, you know, a full, it's all a full build out. And I said, man, I, I want to do it. And, um, I reached out to uh, to a cousin of mine because, like I said, I had invested a lot of my own money into my other business, and I ended up opening two businesses within a month of each other. Oh um, wow! After never opening um, a business at all, so it was a uh, it was it happened. It all happened fast. That is one heck of an adventure! Wow. Know, huh? <laughs> yeah. You when you go in, you go in big. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I definitely dive in head first. I think that's how a lot of entrepreneurs work, right? It's, you know, when they, that idea strikes them and when things start to line up, it's just like, I just have to do this and we jump in and then we figure it out as we go along, Correct. which has its risks and, re but it also has pretty significant rewards and it, and definitely ha has for you. Tell us, so do you still have the boardroom? I don't. I mean, it's still kind of like a sub brand that, you know, I, I could bring back for skate. Um, I don't think for snowboarding. Um, I still love snowboarding, but uh, I tried it. And it doesn't sell as easily um, yeah. and it's a lot of investment. And um, and so I just kind of let that go. The skate um, isn't as heavily invested, um, but it also isn't like a huge profit margin. So, right. Um, right. So kind of focused on what I was good at and selling sneakers. There you go. So you bought that first store and then at kind of at what points did you start thinking about, I can, I can expand this. I can, I can make this it, bigger. It took a long while. I mean, there was always thoughts of doing it um, to the point that um, I, we, uh, my original uh, friend who, who sold me laced, um, came back and invested with me into um we we wanted we really wanted to get the nike um and the jordan uh wholesale account and from our understanding it was super difficult to get it if you were just one single store or if you were too close to someone else who had it or if your uh, trade lines you know hadn't been open for multiple years and there were just so many factors that we decided uh, we found someone who had five locations and they were willing to sell their store and brand along with their account. Um, almost like you would buy like a small franchise or it was a mom and pop and mm -hmm. it didn't quite work out. Um, you know, you know, you think you want, you think you know what you want until you have it. Um, and not in the sense of it was too much to handle. It's just, it wasn't really, um, as fruitful as you would think it is um you have to buy a lot of the stuff that isn't probably going to sell in mm -hmm. order to get the few things that really are going to sell um so i i i try you know so right away i would say i was like i want to grow you know but then had to kind of take a step back when that didn't work um so it took a little while before i tried it again so i want to say maybe about two years ago um I took another chance at it in a really, really small way. There was a pop-up shop uh, available at, in the seaport. I don't know if mm. you've ever seen the little uh, house. I, yeah, I used to live there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 so I, I lived in one of the apartment buildings there. It was yeah, like, yeah. Like I lived in the neighborhood for a now. while. <laughs> yeah, um, but they had these little these little houses, almost like these little sheds, and uh, they were short term. 
and it was a good way to try you know a second location i lived in the neighborhood so it was easy for me to manage it at the same time you know manage the other location um but uh that didn't even i lost a bunch of money it didn't work out and funny enough um towards the end of that i um i met someone uh from the cambridge side mall uh who uh the specialty leasing and they said well why don't you try a pop-up with us in in a big store you know and, and where there's lots of foot traffic and i'm coming off of literally just like you know being down and out like i just lost a bunch of money maybe i shouldn't be doing this again i shouldn't be trying it again and once again i said you know what i'm gonna go for it and try it and we got in i want to say uh august 1st which and it was literally open the doors and it was back to school shopping season so that was like christmas so immediately it went really well soon after that it was literally christmas shopping uh, black friday you know and all that stuff and that went really well and then from there that's um when i started um uh when i started saying well i could probably do this again somewhere else and started looking at other malls and I, at that point i feel like i found the formula that i needed i needed the foot traffic and um and you know needed people to, that were kind of into that mm -hmm. where i think i might have you know maybe that was uh, there was the the income level was fine in seaport but you know probably not the people that were interested in the stuff i was selling mm. so so i had found the two things that i thought were key and part of uh, you know key parts of making making it successful so yeah after that um i did natick mall um and then soon after i opened maybe a week or two into opening the third location we were hit with quarantine and i had to close like it has been you know a few months building this thing up it was doing great right away and then we had just had to close close everything um for some time uh so i'd spend that time moving um within the mall in cambridge side to another location um that kept me busy I did some you know i did most of the work myself i'd go there and do some construction bought some tools and anything i couldn't do myself i'd youtube or get some help but that kept me busy and uh it got my mind going and i said you know i i think when this quarantine list people are really going to want to shop and and i and, and they were itching to spend some money and everyone was getting a little bit of extra help um from the government and i felt like people were going to have some money so i went ahead and signed two more leases while we were during quarantine um and then that gave me two new construction projects um so i built those stores out as well during that time and then soon enough as soon as we were able to go shopping again people were shopping um so with those things being said and done and working out um i just kept i just kept at it and i think i you know ended up with a couple more and i'm at six locations now and then i opened a restaurant because logically right what else do you do if you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no it wasn't so much logically it was very scary i know sneakers i know fashion i know retail i don't know food and and you know and that and, and hospitality as much but um i knew i could learn and i thought i could conquer it so yeah we're about three months into that and it's going really well and it's growing and we have um it's called lace quality kitchen so we sell chicken and waffles all day long we have like different types of chicken grilled chicken and fried chicken and chicken tenders and we call them shoe laced fries and we kind of tie to tie it all back into the into the sneaker culture by um, packaging it all up in a little sneaker box oh that's amazing i love that idea but wow you just i mean what an amazing story when other people were you know shrinking back you just went all in. It just what a great story cuz it just says a lot about who you are and how you think about risk and risk versus reward and being able to really think about what the future is going to look like and and then capitalize on it. So congratulations. That's just amazing. Thank so you. I'm, yeah. I'm really curious about how 
So during the pandemic, right? So I actually did a lot of renegotiation work for retail st stores who were in malls and they had big landlords and they, you know, when they weren't able to be open, they were struggling to, to take care of the rent. And so how did you manage the relationships with your attorney or with your landlords during that process? Yeah. During um, the shutdown? At six, at seven locations um, and and uh, four landlords. So each one was unique to say the least. Um, some were a lot easier to work with than others. Um, some just fell in the right timing where technically like Natick, my lease didn't start until after the quarantine. So I kind of was able to just kind of sign a new lease there. Um, Simon Malls, I signed during the quarantine. So my, technically my rents wouldn't start until we were open mm -hmm. um, and then um and then i still had you know my mass ad location which um i ended up you know that was a little longer uh, negotiation but but definitely you know um i think everyone was every all the landlords wanted to keep who they could you know they mm -hmm. weren't i don't feel like they were they, they understood that everyone was hurting and didn't want to come down banging the hammer, um, but needed to also pay some of their bills as well. So, um, you know, I think uh, I was, they were understanding as was I, um, as to, you know, what they, what the concessions could be, but they were all unique, you know, and there were all different ways to, to deal with them. Um, you know, also like moving into a new space gave me that same kind of like deal where, all right, I'm, I moved during quarantine so I can, you know, we can, your rent will start as soon as we get open again. Mm -hmm. So just kind of repositioning things um, was kind of like what, what helped me kind of get through it. Um, I didn't have much going on online sales or anything like that. So, but I also, like I tell everyone, I didn't have, you know, payroll and I didn't have, you know, all these other, I didn't have a bunch of rents to pay. And so it could have been worse. Um mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of what helped me get through it. So I want to go back a little bit. So to the, to the, the business, when you bought the five stores, right. And so did you get rid of those stores in the end? Yeah. Um, the stores was op were open since 1918. It was a really, really old family business. Um, and we pretty much bankrupted it. Um, and my friend invested nearly a million dollars with me um, and uh, and lost a bunch of money. Um, and we're still friends. So <laughs> that speaks volumes about, you know, what, uh, you know, he believes in me and, and, mm -hmm. he's, and he's been, and to this day, we still partner and we talk about, you know, doing more things together mm. and we actually have something in the works now. So. So I'm really curious. So I had, so I had a guest on a while ago, um, Kim Bassett, and she bought, she and her husband bought their company. They provide promo, pro, uh, promotional materials like, you know, coffee mugs and, sure. and, and other things. And she, when she, they got, they were really excited. They bought the company. She's in Vegas. They bought the company from uh, some folks here in California. And when they bought it, it wasn't what they thought. And she, she talks about kind of the, the disillusion that happened once the sale was finalized and they looked and they went, crap, this, yeah. is, not, this is not worth what we thought. Tell me about the, the, what you discovered about the business that you bought and then take us through kind of how you, what that negotiation was um, in the process and then what you discovered afterward uh yeah definitely what we were after was was that um these stores were in on main street and in, in small suburban towns mm. um you know 30 40 miles outside of outside of mass outside of boston um so they weren't in the hub right they weren't right. like here in boston on you know on the major in the major places where they 
where we would have liked them to be. So we were chasing more um, of that Nike, you know, Jordan contract, and we had the Boston store. So it was like we could bring stuff into Boston and, you know, and, and really pump up the Boston store and build up the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the goal. So I think we were kind of willing to overlook some of the things that we probably should have done a little more due diligence, but yeah, there were some cooked Excel spreadsheets um, looking back on it now, you know, um, there was also a huge internal theft problem that, you know, maybe the owner wasn't aware of, or he was just ready to just hand that problem off to someone else. Mm. Um, uh, But he did make the sale pretty easy for us. Um, the owner financed us on a lot of uh, on the um, you know we, uh, on the on the on the purchase on the debt. Um, he gave us tons of inventory. You know he was hands on with making sure that you know we were at Nike meetings and meeting who we needed to to keep that relationship going. Um, but yeah, the, my disillu- biggest disillusion was thinking that just having a Nike Jordan account was going to guarantee you big bucks um and then you go to these meetings and you see all this product that doesn't release for six months and if you're a sneakerhead like me you, you want to know what's coming out six months from now you kind of on the inside you know to know like before it was before i don't say before the internet but there was it wasn't as easy to to have like to know everything that, that was coming out so it was cool to have some insider info but what i learned quickly was that you had to buy and purchase like a lot of their regular inline crap um, to even get the other stuff. And then to get the good stuff, it wasn't like I could order an unlimited amount. You were allocated uh, an X amount of pairs per store. And then that all depended on whether your stores were um, good, better or best doors, which those things, were determined by nike based on sales and and you know the way it looks and Mm -hmm. and where it is and things like that um so then they even had beyond best was a tier zero which was like what maybe a handful of stores in in the united states have and that's the product we really wanted um so you kind of realize that you're not getting what you think you were getting mm. gonna get or what you were chasing after mm-hmm. and then they would put them under the table and you couldn't see the stuff until you saw all the other crap you'd spend two three hours in there looking at crap and ordering and you'd have to order the apparel and you'd have to order just to kind of get to you know a handful of shoes that you might want and only be able to order a very limited amount of so that was the biggest disillusion um, mm. for me, uh, anyways. But but yeah, that was that was uh, that was that in a nutshell, and that kind of really what was my catalyst in, in me pivoting into consignment. And I said, you know what? Why you know carry all this uh, in overhead and, and have to stock all this inventory of stuff that's not going to sell, and then use the little bit of money I made from the stuff that does sell to pay that off and then just put the rest of the stuff on sale just so I can get my money back. It just seemed like, like a, like a really um, weird cycle. It didn't seem like the, like the right thing to do. Um, I love that. I love that story because um, I, I, I like doing David and Goliath negotiations. So I like helping smaller businesses negotiate with bigger companies. And the, there are a couple things kind of, things that I'm hearing in that story. One is that if you're going to buy, if you're buying a business and a contract is one of the key reasons why you're buying it, whether it's a liquor license, whether it's this, you know, that a contract that exists with a major company, there's a lot of things that you need to do in, from a due diligence perspective to review that contract, make sure that it's, you know, in line with the business and the direction that you're taking, make sure that it's transferable, that, that because some, some contracts you can't even transfer without permission from, from the, the, the counterpart. And it's like, you got to make sure you get that. And so there, if if you're, if, if somebody is listening and you're buying, thinking about buying a business, 
make certain that you look at the the key contracts of that business, not just from a, a legal perspective. So a lawyer might look at it and tell you that it's transferable or not and raise some red flags, but you want to look at it from a business perspective. And what I like, Jamil, about what you did is even though you didn't do it at the beginning, you quickly then, as you were living with that relationship, you started going, wait a minute, this, this financially is not, not making sense. Um, And so I really, I really like that. I also like, you know, a lot of times people get really excited, kind of like you were about doing business with a big guy, uh, you know, a Nike, um, right. And, and saying, oh my gosh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm getting that account. I'm in, in business with that guy. But a lot of times it's not necessarily the right decision or the most effective decision. There are other ways to generate the revenue, to generate greater profitability. And, you know, as you describe that process with Nike, what I hear is there, you know, and you you said, you know, lots of overhead, there's a lot of expense in that with limit, with lower margins, because the the product isn't in, you're not excited about selling it, right? You weren't excited about buying it. You're not excited about selling it. It's just part of the the process of being able to do the one sliver of piece of business that you really were excited about. And so there's that, you know, 95% of it was, uh, I don't like this product. I'm not excited about it. Um, and so then you went, wait a minute, I can do this in a completely different way and do it on consignment. And then I don't need that contract. Right. What does that look like? And right. so I want, I want to ask you a question in just a second. So for those of you just tuning in, we're, we're, we're sitting here on in the Venn zone today with Jamil Rodriguez. We are talking about his business laced and his new restaurant in the Boston area. And you can go into ven.zone, V E N N dot zone and get the show notes and you'll get all the information. And we have a free gift waiting for you there too. So Jamil, so now you you've realized you're living with this Nike contract and going, crap, this is not what I want. So how did you one unwind from that, those stores and, and exit that? Because essentially you exited a business and then you started a new one within this process on the same product category, but. They already had, um, so we had the five locations and, and placed already. Um, so we kind of kept them separate, even though we sold, we sold sneakers at both of them. Um, so it cost a bunch of money. We lost a bunch of money. We had ended up closing five locations, losing half a million dollars down, ending up with tons of debt. Um, and uh, and then at effectively realizing that I I don't have any product to sell at, in, at least anymore. Um, mm. So that that's kind of what prompted the, you know, well, what are we gonna do? How, what can we sell? Um, and I was lucky enough um, to have some friends who were kind of already ahead of the curve. They were sell, reselling the sneakers on eBay. And he had a good 60 or 70 pairs of sneakers that he had actively listed on eBay. But for some reason, they weren't necessarily selling just yet. Um, and he brought them to my, he said, you want me to put them in here and let's see what happens. And now if, you know, if, um, if I had 60, 70 pairs before in the store, maybe five or 10 were the ones that, you know, people really wanted and the rest was kind of filler. Now I had 60, 70 pairs of sneakers that people really, really want, but the price tag is much higher. So that was the trade-off. Um, and that was what I was worried about was, was there a market for people willing to pay double and in some cases triple the suggested retail price for something that's no longer available Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't a new concept but it was somewhat new for sneakers Um, and also if you're like a uh, if you're like a dedicated sneakerhead you almost kind of like frowned upon it like like I, i get mine for regular price you know i don't pay extra for my sneakers like and now it's the norm now you can't buy them at regular price if you do it's almost like scoring on a lot on a scratch ticket like 
you know, it's a, uh, so, so that it all kind of grew at the same time, you know, the market grew um, and it changed and, and it also, and we were kind of one of the first ones um, doing it out of a brick and mortar where everyone else was kind of still uh, online, uh, mm. was kind of selling these online. Um, there was a big company in New York, Flight Club, which was doing it a lot longer than us. Um, and they were kind of the benchmark for that. Um, and they were like a, you know, it was like a candy store for sneakers. Like you walk in and they have stuff you, man, I missed out on that. Oh, wow. I can't believe they have that in stock. Uh, you know, and it would come with a hefty price tag. Um, so, you know, so I, I don't know. I would say like, I wouldn't say I broke some of my rules, but I was willing to say, you know, what, let's give it a shot. And people started buying them. And then uh, as that happened, more people uh, started bringing us stuff to sell for them. Uh, and then uh, we learned that this didn't only apply to Nikes and Jordans. This uh, you know, applied to limited edition New Balances and clothing by Supreme and accessories. And now, you know, there's anything pretty much limited edition uh, you can sell. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people are selling trading cards again, um, you know, Pokemon cards and, and baseball cards and basketball cards. Um, along with in the same places as sneakers and clothing and, and accessories and stuff. So it, it's interesting um, to see where it's going and where it's, where, you know, where it's been and where it's going. I, I love it. I just, I just love, I just love how you just kind of went, oh, heck with it. I'm just going to try this and see what the heck happens and that it's completely paying off for you. Now, when we talked, when we talked a while ago, one of the things that I was really curious about is that the type of people who come in to consign, consign the shoes to you. So, um, and I remember you telling me the story of this young, young guy, young uh, teenager, I think yeah. who, who like he, he makes, uh, he makes some decent, he makes some decent pocket money for, for yeah, a teenager. For sure. um, but tell me a little bit about how, cause that's at the, at the basic form, that is a type of negotiation. And so tell us a little bit about um, those people who sell on consignment, who come in and they actually have been out collecting shoes and they come in and they have a number of different things and they've made this into kind of a, a small business for themselves. Tell us a little bit about how that process works. Yeah. So, um, you know, consignment is not anything new. It's not a new type of concept or, or anything, but we did find a way to make it a lot more modern and, and a lot more effective and a lot easier um, and bring it into kind of this new generation. And um, so I can tell you a little bit about how we did that was uh, by creating this like online portal where you can sign up for an account. You will upload the items that you're going to sell ahead of time. Um, it'll tell you the breakdown of, you know, you pick the price and tell you what you're going to get back. Um, at that point, you literally bring the item in for to us. We authenticate, um, we check the condition, we uh, consult with you on the price if, if we need to, and then we uh, we list it for sale um, on this online in our brick and mortar stores. From there, um, you have the you have the ability to change your pricing at any given time. You can you can go on the online portal. You can see the status of it. As soon as it sells, you get an email. Congratulations, your item sold. Um, and then at that point, we can send you a check without you over email, without you having to come in at all to even come in and get paid. So it kind of takes um, some of that old school feeling out of the out of the consignment process. Um, but to tell you a little bit about the uh, vast uh, types of of consigners we have we have consigners uh that are young as 12 and 13 years old and you know maybe they're getting up early and they're getting online and they're getting a couple sneakers or they're going on saturday morning during release dates and they're waiting in line to buy some at Foot Locker, um and they're getting as many pairs as they can and then they're bringing them to us to sell and uh you know they make some money we make some money and it's all kind of like an ecosystem, right? Because it's not really valuable to us um, if it doesn't sell out in Foot Locker. So it's almost like we need them to go ahead and buy them all. <laughs> so they're actually mm. sold out 
and then we can resell them at our store, right? Because if you could if you could buy the Foot Locker for a hundred dollars less, why why buy them from us at all? Right. So, um, so I've had young consigners who you know we I'd like to say we promote entrepreneurship and uh, and and give people you know the opportunity to to have their own business and and learn you know some of the values of buying low and selling high. Um, mm-hmm. So we've had young young consigners. We've we've had also grown people. We had the, the you know the the almost like I don't want to say stay at home moms, but you've got like literally moms who are like uh, I, I could buy and flip some stuff. Like I have some time, you know. Um, and then we have like I have grad students um, who are like I'm paying my way through college with this. It's like you sell enough stuff for me to not have to take up student loans. Um, so, you know, it, it's all a great partnership and, and there's a lots of different sellers and buyers and there's some people who just want, you know, try it out or someone who's like, Hey, I bought the wrong size and I'm stuck with these shoes and I'm like, well, we'll sell them for you and, you know, solve that problem. Um, and then people who just keep doing it and make a, and make a business out of it and people who we've inspired and they've opened their own businesses just from seeing us doing it and then being able to bring us stuff. So. I think uh, I think it's a great it's a, it's a great thing that that uh, that's come of it. That's awesome. I love that. And Jillian Michaels was on the show um, last week. We dropped her episode, and uh, she talked about how she identified. Um, well, she has her part. She has a business partner who's a 50-50 partner with her, and she said an interesting comment. She said that when she was deciding to make him a partner, she realized that what they could do together was so much greater than what she could have built on her own, which is why she made him a 50-50 partner. And I love how you're talking about your consigners because, right, old school, you'd go in, you'd take your stuff and you'd haggle over something, right? But you you have set up a, a system that is more focused on the negotiation and building a relationship with a lot of your consigners um, because they are that ecosystem drives that that price up and and it's just I, I just think it's a it's a beautiful example of how the partnership it creates more value by working together in that ecosystem because as as many of many of my regular listeners know my philosophy is that negotiation is a conversation about a relationship and you cannot win a relationship but you can get more value out of it and that's what you are doing every day through your partnerships through your ecosystem with your consigners creating more value together than than you could create on your own. Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. I love that. 100%. I think that's amazing. I'm sorry. It's 100% a partnership for sure. Um, we couldn't do it without them um, and I'm sure they could sell their stuff on their own so you you know you nurture a relationship and and people trust you and they trust us with thousands of dollars of their inventory. Mhm. Yep. Uh, I just think this has just been, this is so, this is awesome stuff, Jamal. Tell us how, tell people how they can find you. Yeah. On Instagram, we're at Laced, uh, same on Twitter. And uh, you can visit our website, laceboston.com. And uh, those are the three major ways to find us, but you just type in Lace Boston on Google and I'm sure they'll all come up. (laughs) Some other ones that I forgot about. Um, but yeah, that, that would tell you a little more about, about us and, you know, you can find how to, you can find more information on our consignment there. Um, you can see some pictures of the stuff we've done and, uh, you know, a lot of our magic was, uh, working with local artists and national mu- musicians, um, and doing like this meet and greet experience, which we coined the laced experience, uh, where you come in to meet and greet, take a photo op. Um, and leave like way happier fan than you were when you came in. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. There, there's lots of that content available on our website that you can. Very get. cool. And I can't wait. My daughter lives in Boston. One of my daughters lives in Boston. And so I can't wait to come, come 
visit her and I will definitely be coming to check out the store. Okay. Um, I think, I, I just think what you're doing is just fantastic. And what, what's your next plan where, what's next for you and for laced. So, you know, I have the restaurant going and I love, um, I love the way it's turning out. It's just a small place in the food court. I typically tend to start small and see how it works. Um, which is kind of what it did with lace, but, mm -hmm. um, so lace to, uh, the current, the largest store I have, which is kind of like one of the newer ones, um, is 7,500 square feet and it has like a full chef's kitchen in it. That's not where the restaurant is, but, uh, we do have like private event space, you know, so as soon as, uh, restrictions lighten up a bit, we'll be able to do more meet and greet things and things like that. We also have, I think the country's only sneaker museum inside the store, um, so I'm trying to find a way to marry uh, the tech with the with uh, with the brand. So we uh, opened uh, an art gallery. Well, we're building an art gallery in the back of that store, and we have a speakeasy barber shop there. Um, oh wow! Yeah. So if you know, you know, you know, you make an appointment. You you know, you buzz in the door, and there's all these all these like graffiti like from floor to ceiling, like 20 foot ceilings, um, really fun. And what we do is uh, we have a QR code. So you can, if you would like the art, you can just scan it, find out who the artist is, more about them, how to get in touch with them. Um, the plan is to have actual, you know, pieces of art that you could buy. Same thing, you scan it, you know, you might be at a fashion show at our store, which we have one on Sunday coming up actually and you like this piece of art and scan it, you pay the artist directly, you take it home, you know, kind of uh, kind of making that process a little more streamlined. Um, but uh, like I was saying, the food and the sneakers um, is really the plan. And I, I'm trying to find a way to marry those things together and have a, like a space where you can do both at the same time. So uh, that's, that's as much as I can tell you until, uh, <laughs> until I get a little further. I but, love it. I love it. Maybe so, like in uh, in Miami or something. So, oh, that's fantastic. So, if you are in the Boston area, you absolutely have to go check out Lace. Check out the Sneaker Museum, and if 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 you are use a barber, you should go check out the the Speakeasy <laughs> Barbershop. That sounds so much fun. <laughs> it just sounds like so much fun. So I just been a, it's been an honor having you. Thank you for spending some time with, with me and with my audience. And we really appreciate you. And to everybody who's listening, thank you so much. You have given us and gifted us with the most valuable resource you have, which is your time. So thank you. I really appreciate that. And again, just it, go check out Venn.zone. You can get the show notes there and we'll send you, if you go there, we'll get you a free gift too. So look forward to seeing you on the next episode of In the Venn Zone. In the meantime, have a great day and happy negotiating. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this episode of In the Venn Zone with Christine McKay. We invite you to visit our website at www.ven.zone to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Empower the negotiator in you and successfully level the playing field. Join us again next time here on In the Ven Zone.